I used to think of education as not just a career, but a passion for me. But when I say that, I used to think of it as a passion that was all encompassing, that basically all I was, was an educator, that everything that I did was about, you know, what I did as a, a teacher, an administrator, and even to be a speaker. And I think the last while, year or so, has given me this chance to really recalibrate and think about how, yeah, education is something I'm very passionate about, it's something I love, but it's not who I am. It's part of who I am. It's part of what I do. But, you know, being a dad, uh, taking care of my health, outside interests, loving basketball, loving, uh, you know, basketball shoes, things like that are all part of who I am. And I find that it might not make me as good an educator. I don't know. But it makes me more maybe relatable, more authentic. And someone easier to connect with that I'm not just about those things. And I think a lot of times when it consumed me so much, it may have not only hurt things outside that were important to me, but also what I did as an educator, because I didn't understand why everyone else wasn't always about education all the time. And I think we get caught in this trap a lot of times in, in education because it is such an important job. It is so crucial to what we do. Uh, not only in our own lives, but society, in our communities. And why I bring this up is when I was having this conversation with Marita Diffenbaugh, we had a great focus on about the whole child, on being our authentic selves and having that connection. And it has really made me reflect and think about like what is important in the work that we do. And, and like I said, you can be really passionate about education, but I think that when we get to a point where we're so passionate that it's everything about what we do and who we are, we tend to lose ourselves and maybe lose our effectiveness. And I think really thinking about how we actually have different interests and how we look at the outside world of education and bring those stories, bring those lessons learned uh, is really important. And I loved having this conversation with Marita, kind of digging into that, what that means. We talk about her book, uh, Learner, Finding the True, Good, and Beautiful in Education. I give some shout outs to one of my favorite teachers as a kid, uh, Miss Butler, in this podcast. And I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the conversation. I hope you enjoy it too. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kuros with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And today I'm very blessed to have Marita Diffenbaugh. Marita is from uh, Idaho and uh, is agreed to join me today. And we're going to talk a little bit about her educational career, but we're also going to talk about her book, Learner, Finding the Good and Beautiful in Education. Uh, you can see that it's out now on Amazon. If you check the links uh, in the description down below, you'll see this. And I've had some great conversations with Marita about prior to the podcast, uh, prior to recording today. And really one of the things that really sticks out to me is her focus on the whole self, on authenticity and how important that is to the work that we do as an education. And really over the last year, I think for me, one of the aspects I focus on is like, hey, like I am really into education. It's part of part of who I am. And I think uh, it used to be all about who I was. It was like I was defined as an educator. And I think maybe COVID has kind of helped me recalibrate and see the importance and value of those things. And so I'm really excited to talk to you today, Marita, because I know that we have a, a lot of shared interests and I'd love to hear your viewpoints. But if you could just kind of introduce uh, yourself to the audience, who you are, and just tell us a little bit about your educational career and, and what you're doing today. Thank you so much, George. Well, I am an educator of 22 years in Idaho from um, the classroom of about 14 years, and then I moved into um, the administrator role at the district and at the state level. But throughout that journey, I've always followed the same question how can we make sure that learning is available for all of our kids? You know, as a teacher, I noticed that um, not all of my kids were finding success in school. And no matter what I could try to do as an individual teacher, uh, maybe they'd be okay that year, but the next year they wouldn't be. So the system somehow was not really being responsive to every student that was there. So I kept following the question all the way through a variety of um, academic pathways from uh, getting that ed tech 
degree to a superintendent degree and really thinking about school as a system. Mm -hmm. And here's what I took away. Um, it's really important that we uh, focus on kids realizing that they're 100% human. And when we do that, when we really understand that who we are serving and our most important priority is to serve the people um, and put the programs and the system in our back pockets, then I think we're on a good pathway for um, finding success for all kids. So I, I've, I've really been thinking about this a lot in my career and especially um, like as a dad of, of two young girls and, you know, obviously love them to pieces, want them to have the best experience in school. And, you know, even though my girls come from the same family, they're very different already, right? Even though Georgia just turned one, I can tell she's a little bit more shy than Clea was. Uh, she's, she seems to be a lot more independent. Uh, Clea is a lot more extroverted. And I think when I talk about this with people, I want you to see that both of my girls are two totally different people. They have different strengths. They have different abilities. And are you, will you bring that out in them? Or you just see them as the Kuros kids and label them as like they come from a, a, fa a certain family and, you know, uh, not understand that they actually have different experiences, even though they are from the same family. They have different strengths and tap into that. And I think that's something that um, is really important to me. It's really that you know that you know my kids, that you understand who they are, you understand their differences. And like I, I've been kind of talking about, like I, I don't, I, I say this all the time and uh, I don't think every kid's going to be good at math and nor do I care. I, do, I think some kids are great at math. I think that's awesome. Let's develop that. But I think your point, and I don't know if you can maybe just uh, dig deeper into this, is, and, maybe, and maybe I'm totally off in how I'm understanding this, it's that we're trying to mold kids to be good in certain things that our system says are important as opposed to creating a system where we help kids find what they're good at, what they're passionate about and develop that. Is that, is that correct? And kind of how I'm, I'm interpreting that? Yes, absolutely. That is an exactly where I was coming from with that, George. And so then, so then if, if not the programs, then what? Mm -hmm. Then what's school all about? Mm -hmm. if, if we're not giving them this program of K-12, if, if that's not what it is, what is it? And that's what I tried to answer in the book where I really started thinking about what if what are the humans doing in mm -hmm. this space called school? What's the job of the learner and what's what's the uh, service of the education? And and so really going really simply back to those basic things, listening, like you're talking about with your daughters. Do I know the kids? Have I welcomed mm -hmm. the kids? Do I, do I understand what makes um, them smile? Mm -hmm. Do I understand what gives them anxiety and makes them a little nervous? And um, ultimately, are they feeling like they are being served when they come to school um, and respected right where they're at? And, and when you have that happening, it doesn't matter what age you are, when you feel like you belong and you're respected, you will be safe to grow and to learn. So this, I'm going to ask you this. And I'm going to give you, because I, 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 we, I have no questions prepared when I do these podcasts because I really want to listen to the guests, kind of understand, you know, some of their experiences and, you know, just to be conversational, right? So I'm going to give you a little heads up because this might be a little bit of a tricky one. I, I'm going to ask you, like, can you give a teacher a concrete strategy on, you know, something they could do at, you know, grade four, you know, high school, something like that. So I'm going to get you that in your mind, but here's something that I've encouraged people to do. And you can see the, a link to it in the description. Um, there's a post I wrote a long time ago called five questions uh, to ask your students to start at the beginning of the school year. And it's something about like, what are your passions? What are your strengths? Uh, one of the questions I asked specifically is what does success at the end of the school year look like to you? So, not because I, I find a lot of times we define success for our kids when you and I could both say we're successful yet our interpretation of what success means can be totally different, which is a, is fine for the adults, but we tend to define that mm -hmm. for kids, which is, I, I have a, a struggle with and that strategy I've encouraged and I've seen a lot of teachers actually utilize it and not just like, Hey, this is an icebreaker activity at the beginning of the year to get to my, to know my kids. It's an activity to actually yeah, get to know your kids, but utilize that information. So if I have a kid says, I want to be a YouTuber, then how do they actually say like, hey, we're doing the science concept. Can you explain this video through a 
you know, a YouTube video, like a video. Can you actually, you know, you want to be a vlogger, then vlog this concept of science. And actually not just knowing our students, but utilizing that information to move backwards from there. So that's one of the strategies. And like I said, there's a, you'll see a link to the post mm -hmm. uh, in the description if you want to dig in more. But do you, Marita, do you have something like, hey, here's like an example of how I did what I'm talking about, you know, in the classroom? Yeah, I, I think that helping involve the student in the process of learning. So when I started to explain to the students what we had to do in fourth grade, I actually, one time I did a four or five combo. And when I did four or five combo, it forced me to be more allegiant to the kids than the content because I, it was two full grade levels of lots of standards and curriculum. And so I just put it out there to them and said, here's what fourth graders are kind of supposed to be learning about. And here's what fifth graders are supposed to be learning about. Do you see any of these things that we can connect and learn together? Are there certain things that we need to do separate? And so basically, um, we kind of cleaned the garage together, if you will. Mm -hmm. What are we going to keep? What are we going to research more? And what are we going to let go of? Um, and that helped me as a teacher sort kind of prioritize the so much that I felt like I had to give to the kids and that was my responsibility, but I, I didn't do it alone. I activated the kids and, and when you can form the question, you can get help from any kid, even if they're a five-year-old, even if they're a two-year-old, if you mm -hmm. can form the question um, as, a, as a teacher and say, here's what I'm trying to figure out, what can we do about that? Uh, and you, of course, you have your teaching partners mm -hmm. and things like that to help with that as well. And you try to get some of that organized. But I, I just guess involve the learner in the lesson planning. And you'd be surprised at how, how wonderful that is. The, the, so like when I hear the term backwards design, right? A lot of people use that terminology backwards design. And they're really referring to uh, designing from the curriculum and, and kind of like, you know, kind of what are your objectives, things that. But I think when you're talking about backwards design, you're like actually start with the student and move backwards from there, right? Like there's ways you can understand your student and then tie the curriculum, right? Exactly. So like you can't just say, like I would never say to a Precisely. school, ignore the curriculum because that's easy for me to say as an outsider while you all lose your job, right? Like I'm not, there's a reality of that. Yeah. Like there's expectations that you have, you know, that you sign up for and whether you like it or not, like I don't want to encourage people not to do their job but it's really kind of understanding our students. That's why I talk about the notion of innovate inside the box and, and as something is really important. And I, I'm, I'm gonna maybe ask you a little bit of a personal question and you, if you don't wanna answer that, it's totally fine. Um, but your focus, okay. uh, and I think, this is, I think this is part of the conversation. Like we had a lot of conversations before we started getting on the podcast. And I think, I think for me, um, one of the reasons I do that is because I want to do the exact same thing that you're trying to, like, I don't want to just like have a list of questions. I want to get to know you. I want to, you know, kind of hear about some of your experiences and then try to bring them out the best as possible as I can, you know, by, through my questions. And do you, like, how do you see like kind of your, your personal journey in life? Like we've talked about this whole person, um, your, your, your ultimately your story has got you to see this as an emphasis on what you do in education, right? Because I think a lot of what you talk about mm -hmm. is coming from like, here's some of my experiences and here's why, how I connect them to education, not necessarily the other way around. So how have you seen like, you know, some of your own personal experiences, mm -hmm. your own, you know, your own personal journey kind of shaping some of, of what you talk about right now? Well, I'll let you know, I start the book with this really personal story about being a teen mom. And one of uh, my best experiences, when I thought about how I can share my very best learning experience, where, where I learned something critical, it was when I learned how to take care of my baby. Mm -hmm. And um, here I was really young and I take home this baby and that seemed so fragile and like needed and was counting on me to do everything. And I did not feel mm -hmm. competent for that. So I had a great relationship with my doctor who said, here's my phone number. Can you believe this? My doctor gave wow. me her personal phone number and I called her. She says, you call me. She knew she saw me. She knew my need. She knew my heart and I was trying to do what's best for my child. Mm -hmm. And she says, you call me if the little bud, if you're just struggling and you don't know what to do. And I did, I called her a lot. And so one of the things that she did was she listened. I, this is how I came up with the learner acronym. I unpacked what Dr. Armour did to help me feel competent as a mom 
at, at a very young age. And, and my calls to her decreased over time. I gained confidence, but ultimately she listened. She right. empowered me. She analyzed to see where I was. And then she started matching resources to my needs. That's learn all the way up there. So hmm. then I could then be successful in experiences. And all along, Dr. Armour decided that I'm going to have a relationship with this patient in a special way. And and that was a big investment in me. And I, I guess I feel like that's that's what we owe our children when mm -hmm. they come to school. And that's what you're asking for, George, as well for your daughters to be mm -hmm. respected in such a way that that they can feel successful and they can grow. And and we know that when they are having that relationship, um, they will it, they will be able to um, make success in, in any kind of curriculum or situation. Well, what was the name of your doctor? Dr. Armour. Dr. Armour. Is it from Idaho? Is she from Idaho? No, no, she's from California and she's since passed. Um, so she's she's no longer on this world, but she lives through me every day. And I, I know that she is uh, the. If I really think mm -hmm. about who inspired me to be a teacher, you know, you, you have your teacher stories and those are kind of easy. But mm -hmm. when I think about one of the I guess when I was the most desperate for the learning, mm -hmm. she was my most powerful teacher in that moment. So so there's actually um, uh, I, I, and I don't I, I've read the book. Um, a long time ago uh, is a book by Atul Gawande and he he's a, actually a physician I think he's a physician I know he's a doctor and his big thing is really kind of being like that really human element to the medical practice and uh, he, there's things I reference in his book talk he talks about like uh, the seven touch rule like basically how we make those individual connections to actually create mass change because a lot of times you know we we go into uh, big giant sessions we share ideas uh, and we hope that you know everyone changes their practice but really a lot of times what happens is those one-on-one -on -one connections where you actually have become advocates and stuff like that and he talks about like how the medical profession should actually kind of shift in the sense that people need to feel cared for. There is emotional connection to what they're doing. Like, you know, we talk about like bedside manner, things like that. So it's really kind of fascinating to see how much of an impact that's made on you. Um, the other thing that I think is r really important that you share, and it's something that I really focus on. I, I remember, I see, I saw just a post today, somebody saying like, hey, uh, outsiders shouldn't be telling educators how to be teachers. And I, I agree with that to some extent. Like, I, I think that obviously, we, you know, we have a focus on our, like schools, you know, if they uplift communities, I think it's really important for a community voice to be not only engaged, but empowered in that process. And I'm not advocating that outsiders should be telling teachers how to teach, but I always do advocate that we need to look at things outside of education to learn from, to become better. And you share those lessons from your doctor, those personal experiences, and really powerful how that made you a better teacher and how that, you know, obviously, you know, made you a great mom to your kids. And it's like, what were the things that you learned from there too? And I think that we can find learning in any space that we're willing to actually look. But if we get to the point of arrogance where we feel like nobody can make us better teachers other than other teachers, I think we lose out on something, right? And I think it maybe feels like a little bit disconnected. So I, I, I so appreciate you sharing that story because mm -hmm. one of the things I really focus on is how do we like learn from outsiders? How do we learn from like the little, um, you know, like I, one of my biggest influences in education is my mom and dad who had a grade two education and grade six education, right? But they taught me a lot about how to run a school in through their actions, uh, how they ran a restaurant. And there's so many similarities. And I think as long as we're willing to learn, um, we can. And so you, you referenced this was the beginning of your book. And I just want, so learner, uh, finding the, the true good and beautiful in education, and you are uh, emulating that through your stories and what you're sharing with everybody today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your book? Can you tell us a little bit about, and I know you kind of mentioned some of your opening stories, but like, like, tell us a little bit about your book. And then what, what's your hope for people that read it, you know, what they walk away with? Yes. Well, I had an opportunity. I was challenged by uh, 
you know, Jimmy Cassis and Jeff Zuhl to write this book and be part of Connect Ed Books, which was great. Um, it came at the time when I'm getting ready to launch a new school up here at Elevate Academy North, which means that I'm getting a whole new staff and, mm -hmm. and recruiting people to be in a school that is, um, you know, community driven. As you had mentioned, mm -hmm. we're taking a lot of influence from uh, what's going on in industry and making sure that we really do teach what the needs are for jobs up here. So all that being said, it had me digging into what is, again, the job of that learner? What is the what is the actual behavior and the job of a learner? And what is the service of education? And so the acronym, um, kind of guides us through that part, but there's something else that weaves throughout, and it's this idea of the true, the good, and beautiful in education. Mm -hmm. And uh, while moving to North Idaho, I found my husband's um, kindergarten report card, and it was just crazy because the timing of this, I looked at it and I saw so much about um, about Andy as a whole. Mm -hmm. like. Like, did he enjoy music? Did he love to play with his friends? There was all this, like, what I kind of would consider fluff compared to what I've seen in report cards. Mm -hmm. So I went to that same school district and pulled up the report card to compare them. And then I sorted what was true, meaning like standards based, right? Mm -hmm. Where was the good that kind of like communication, like friendship and team? Mm -hmm. And what was the beautiful, the creative, they appreciate? appreciates music, appreciates mm -hmm. art. Where was that? And uh, it was missing from the 21st century report card, completely wow. missing. And it was still there, even to the point where there was this response where a parent could write back to the on the report card and it would go back and they would have this hmm. two-way communication. So that, that idea of true, good and beautiful, how can we bring the good and the beautiful into education in a way that's mindful. We're kind of being forced to do that through some of the social emotional learning needs that are coming up. And a lot of the mm -hmm. current events that we see are happening in school might be a symptom of, of us lacking that whole human experience and honoring um, those that time for those lessons, just for the human lessons of, of being well. And I'll just loop in one more time on yep. um, that community idea. Uh, I've, I've asked, different employers in our area, what is it that you need for employees? And it's fascinating. I'm thinking like literally skills for our metals shop, for our right. construction shop. I'm coming ready with my checklist of skills. Mm -hmm. And here's what they say, show up, be kind, you know, be safe mm -hmm. and be a learner. Mm -hmm. We'll do the rest from there. We'll, we'll right. figure out the bundling of the skill sets that are specific to our jobs from there. And so that, is hopefully what people will be taking away when they read Learner of those human skills that are can easily be interweaved and regardless of what age you teach. And really, it's not just a K-12 book, it's a human book on how we learn and um, how we best support each other in that. So, so there's so much I've written down here that I kind of want to touch base on based on what you're saying. One of the things that um, I've really pushed back on the term is data driven because it's like, it's totally taking away stories from kids in many faces there. And I don't like, I've always said this. I don't think anyone who uses the term data driven hates children, but I think we're trying to adopt things from like analytics, analytics from like baseball and from like Coca-Cola and businesses and things like that. But we're such a human profession, right? Like we're taking the most human professional wor world and we're starting to reduce it to letters and numbers. And I think there's really something inherently wrong with that. And so I talk about the idea of learner driven evidence informed, like, yeah, we need to know the kids in front of you. Why are you there? Right. And we use evidence to inform our practice we're not driven by it, but like to help us, uh, you know, better serve kids. The, that, the, the term, when you talk about, um, you know, what employers are looking for, one of the things I've always talked about, and there's a blog post, I think I wrote years ago called the sponge factor is that when I was looking to hire new people, my biggest thing was that you were willing to learn, right? So if you came into that interview and you said, look, I got 30 years of experience. I know what I'm doing. That was a concern. That was like a flag because it's like, so like, you're good. Like, that's it. We're just done. And I could go a lot further with someone who had a, the ability to learn and grow, but also, you know, was did in a respectful way. And I think that that was really uh, important. The, the one story I want to share, uh, you know, talking about that report card Miss Butler, my grade four teacher, shout out Miss Butler. So 
love Miss Butler. I love Miss Butler. And uh, she actually, um, she actually, when I was a kid, like I'm starting to tear up just talking about this. When I, when I was a kid at the end of the year, <laughs> this is a little bit embarrassing. I loved the Smurfs. Okay. So I love the Smurfs. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know why I love the Smurfs. I just love the Smurfs. And uh, she knew this about me. And at the end of the year, she, she basically made a card for every kid. She made mine on a cutout of a Smurf. So she knew this about me. And I remember her talking about like how much she loved that I would bring uh, pizza from the restaurant to, to give all to the kids, you know, like, and how much, you know, people appreciated my family and all that we did. And I actually remember so many things that she wrote that are tied to what you talked about that, you know, the good and beautiful in education. And I can remember that grade four. um, It wasn't a report card. It was just a card to me. And, and I can remember that more than anything I ever got in a report card, anything I received from any teacher from kindergarten, grade 12 was what Miss Butler did. And then when I became a teacher, every year I taught, I did the exact same thing for my kids. I would write a card, talk about how much I appreciate them, very specific stories on why I cared about them. And that was something I learned from Miss Butler. And I just, I, I love that because, of, you know, kind of seeing that education, I think that is something that, you know, a lot of times, um, Kelly Wilkins, my favorite superintendent of all time, uh, my former boss, she said that the way you assess drives your teaching, not the other way around. So if all we're looking at is for scores and test scores, then we, be, then we start teaching towards the test, right? But if you find that good and beautiful, you find that humanity um, in, in what we do, I think that brings out something. And it's, it's not like a, it's not a fluffy thing. It actually, you know, people feel valued. They actually do way better. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question. You, you, you said you're starting a, a new, uh, you're starting a new school. Is that, and that's coming up, I think right away. This is the first time. So like, yes. what are your hopes for this? It is. Well, so, yeah. we we're doing groundbreaking. Well, tell us, tell us about that. Like what, what's, you know, tell hopes. us about the start and, and actually okay. like, what, what do you hope for? Yes. Well, um, it's such an honor to be part of the Elevate Academy network where um, there was an original school, um, Elevate Academy in Caldwell, Idaho, that started Mm -hmm. off. And the focus was what drew me um, away from the current job I was in into this opportunity was that all the ingredients that I felt were there that would help every kid be successful. Um, From mastery-based education, meeting a kid where they are and grow them, to the career technical piece. So we can really make sure we're bundling skill sets along the way a course college is still an option but what if you wanted to just work mm-hmm. right outside of school or why can't we activate some internships right. our industries are hungry for employees right now and they're ready to hire our kids now and so how can we be responsive as well to where that we really do we've talked pipeline for a long mm-hmm. time but really do the kids understand the dots that are connected between what they teach and what the opportunities are in the community and then ultimately really looking for the kids who are not finding success in school. I I taught a lot of grade levels, but I spent a lot of time in fifth grade. And one thing I realized is that's the halfway mark where if that kid has not found success, systematically they may have had a good fourth grade year or a good fifth grade year but if they don't feel like they that school's not their thing then something dramatically different needs to happen or it's just going to get worse from here they have six more years right Right. and so how can we make this relevant to them and so that's our school we're we're opening august 23rd 2022 where um we we did the research during a pandemic we are doing construction in the middle of a wild construction time but what What's awesome about that is the community in North Idaho and Kootenai County specific is getting around this. They see the need Mm. and they're excited. And I'm just excited to be able to show how um, there can be an option for kids to uh, to be seen and known and and uh, to find success in their unique way. So this is this is uh, something I share with groups I work with all the time is that my job is not to get every kid to college. My job is to help every kid find a pathway to success that is meaningful to them. And I, I love what you're sharing because that is exactly the focus of the work that you're doing. And so I, I really appreciate that. I'm really excited for you. I'm excited for your staff. I'm excited for your community. Uh, I'm gonna ask you, you one last question that doesn't have to do with education. You, I think you're the first person on the okay. podcast from Idaho. 
I don't think, I think that's, the, you are a first, right? For, I am. For shout out, wow. sh- shout out to Idaho. So, okay, so, Woo. so Idaho. Okay, so, but do you, do you live by Boise? You said, you mentioned Boise. No, I live in North Idaho, so at the Panhandle, very close to Canada. Oh, very close to Canada. Okay, so, because <laughs> Boise is known for the blue field, right? Yeah. Like, that's a big thing, the, the blue field. So, you yep. live in Idaho, yep. like, yep. okay. What's the best thing about living in Idaho? What's the best thing? Ah, uh, you can pick. You can pick three. You can pick three if you need to, is, right? I know you can go on all day. Okay, I'm going to pick three. You do it. For me, it will be the mountains. Okay. Uh, yeah, of course, it's the people. I I love the idea of the community feel, but it, as far as just space and geography, it's the mountains. And uh, where wherever you go, you can find uh, a place to hike. And I am addicted to the summit view. Yeah. And uh, walking up tall mountains is therapy to me. And so um, it is such a joy to be able to just go. Even during the pandemic, when we were kind mm-hmm. of all stuck, we I never. Uh, had to stop mountain hiking and i was really grateful for that and i love idaho for for how beautiful it is for that yeah and the the one thing people always because like well i used to i get to travel all the time right about to start again and they'll say like what is your um what's your favorite place to go right and to me it's it's i don't have a place right i don't think of a, a a place specifically I always think about the places that I go and how the people make me feel in those spaces. Right. And I'll tell you that I've been to Idaho and they're just super kind. Um, you know, and I, I find to be honest, that's kind of everywhere I go. Cause I connect with educators who are notoriously wonderful people, yes. uh, in my opinion. But I just, I know that I appreciate you said that about the people. Cause it's like, uh, I got to connect with a bunch of people from Idaho this past week and, I uh, really appreciated them and their focus on kids and the focus all they do. So, Marita, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Absolutely. And everyone, um, if you, you check out the book Learner, Finding the Good, True, and Beautiful, uh, Finding the True, Good, and Beautiful in Education, and congratulations uh, to you on the book. And I wish you continued thank success. You. And thank you for taking the time. And everyone, thank you for taking the time to listen. I hope you have a wonderful day.